Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Jakari Jackson. Here's what we have in store for you on this July 2nd, 2013 edition. Tonight, the DHS buys 7,000 fully automatic assault rifles and calls them personal defense weapons. Meanwhile, Homeland Security might be looking to arm TSA agents. And did a Major League Baseball announcer advertise for the Illuminati during a televised baseball game? What the? That's up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Top story headline is Homeland Security set to arm TSA agents. That is a very frightening image. Let's go to the article here. A solicitation posted on the Fez Biz Ops website yesterday details Homeland Security's requirement for, fire, for a firearms range to conduct mandatory quarterly qualifications and other firearms training. DHS personnel will use a facility for 25 days out of every quarter, and almost half a million rounds will be fired per year. We'll get back to that in just one second. A separate briefing rooms for students will be requested. Range rules must allow shooters to draw and fire from the holster and from concealment, as well as permitting tactical move and shoot drills. A government security news report confirms that the firing range will be used by TSA to train its employees and DHL, DHS personnel. So we're looking at this. We see, well, let's go back to that quote first. Half a million rounds will be fired per year. So they need a place where they can fire at least in one location, half a million rounds per year. Now, keep in mind, this is an, an agency, uh, the DHS, that has over 2 billion rounds of ammunition. So if you expend this at half a million rounds a year, how long is it going to take you to use up all of your hollow point bullets? That's just, you know, a practical concern that I have. But more than this, we see an agency that has now uh, dogs. We showed you that uh, report yesterday. They have these x-ray scanners that can unzip your DNA. Uh, and now we're going to give these people firearms and training, uh, an agency that regularly harasses people with colostomy bags and puts their hands in young children's pants. Now these people are going to have firearms and firearms training. Now, you, you might be saying, well, what kind of guns will they have? I'm not exactly sure the type of guns, but we have this article. DHS buys 7,000 full auto assault rifles and calls them personal defense weapons. This is the article from Mike Adams earlier this year. Now, this is 7,000 fully automatic rifles. This is to say nothing of the uh, anti-tank, or not the anti-tank, the anti-mine uh, personnel carriers, uh, the bullets, the hollow points. Some of these are sniper rounds, and they have all this training all this gear and they say it's not for you it's just for training purposes we're just going to train like we're in the middle of a actual war but it's not for you uh, the american citizens so you can believe that if you want meanwhile uh, russian troops are coming to this country to train uh, for uh, urban unrest or whatever else i'm not saying that's directly linked to the dhs but they're training with fema and so forth. Well, i guess it is linked to the dhs all right now we're going to shift gears but don't make shy this is a very important issue these people are now arming themselves these this group of uh, people who claim they can read your mind. I forgot about that. Uh, TA, TSA says they can le read your mind if they go to an eight-hour course or whatever. I don't know how, how long is the course. I don't remember how long the course is. But for a very minimal amount of time, they come out with Professor Xavier Powers and uh, fully automatic weapons. And they say that they can read your mind and also, I guess, shoot you because they're now adequately trained to do so. We'll move on to this. Uh, we'll move on to a situation where somebody was not adequately trained to use their firearm, and that is the case of Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman. Trayvon supporters threaten riots, looting if Zimmerman is acquitted. Supporters of Trayvon Martin are threatening to stage riots and looting if George Zimmerman escapes conviction, with scores of Twitter users taking to social networks to promote chaos and violence in major cities across the United States. Zimmerman haters also celebrated the fact that CNN broadcast the social security number live of Zimmerman uh, yesterday tweeting, now he can be victimized. And as we reported to you last year, there are also, uh, there are also tweets and people on Twitter saying that they were uh, going to riot if Mitt Romney won the election. And we'll get to that in just one second. But first, let's go to some of these tweets. Uh, if we slow it down here. Let's see. When Zimmerman gets off today, how many, oh, N-words are going to riot? Let's move on to the next one. And if they let Zimmerman walk, people gone riot. At, uh, at least let's just roll through and let everybody see these things. So these are the kind of the tweets that people are putting out. 
uh, various uh, people with nothing better to do. And as I said last year when we had the, uh, the Mitt Romney threats and so forth, a lot of these are people, just ignorant children with nothing better to do, so they go to social media and say they hate George Zimmerman because that's the trendy thing to do. So yeah, I'm pl pretty sure most of these people won't do anything unless uh, you know, provocateur it starts it, but most of these people won't uh, take the, uh, the initiative to start something themselves. But let's say you know, if you have several people, and I'm not exactly sure how many people, but several people, let's say one out of every thousand of these people are actually serious about these actions, I mean, aren't we concerned for the safety of George Zimmerman, aren't we concerned for the safety of the city? And people are concerned about the safety of the city. I saw a video earlier today, I believe it was the police chief and some other people who were in the town, uh, Trayvon Martin, and they say, hey, we're preparing, we're not telling you exactly what we're going to do uh, if, uh, if a riot or something breaks out, but we are preparing and we've made uh, adequate measures, and I'm very curious of what those measures are. Now let's go to this, Obama supporters continue to threat riots, assassinate Mitt Romney. Now this was last year, and if we can scroll down a little bit, we'll take a look at some of these tweets, so I'll let the, uh, the viewers read them for themselves. And these are the tweets that came out last year during the election cycle, and people said, hey, if Mitt Romney wins, I'm going to burn this mother effer down, I'm going to shoot him, I'm going to kill him. We saw the, uh, the video of the lady saying she was going to punch Mitt Romney in the testicles and so forth, just all kinds of wild, crazy things. And of course, we know uh, history says that, that he lost, and I'm not saying history <laughs> should say that he did, but... And I'm not endorsing Obama, I'm not endorsing Romney, I'm just an advocate for peace. And these are the kind of things that go on and nobody really takes them too seriously. Even though the, the FBI, and I believe it was Houston, was tipped off to some uh, people who wanted to kill Occupy protesters and nothing was done about that, if memory does serve me right. Now I'm about to jump over. It's got all these tweets, all these profane tweets about Romney. I can't even flip my papers, I got so many of them. All right, now let's go on to this. 3D printer company aims to block printing of guns. Now we've had Cody Wilson on our show many times. He's told us about uh, the printable gun technology. Now a company is trying to block that. Let's go to this. A Danish 3D printer company has developed an algorithm that would prevent independent 3D printer owners from being able to print gun parts. And you can see it right there on your screen. And the company is called Create It Real. And basically they have a software that will block any uh, user from making a 3D firearm or any parts thereof. Now. We talk about the 3D printing technology, which is not limited to guns. That's one of the more sensational things that it can do, but it can make anything. I've seen it make model planes and model buildings and all kinds of deals. But when you say you want to make a firearm, now you're some, uh, somebody who needs to have this technology censored. And just think about this. All these people who are very into technology, like I said, this is a, a little more advanced than you know, what I'm used to. But if you're into the 3D printing technology or any technology, they're censoring Cody Wilson and other people like him who like this type of technology. So if somebody just says, I don't want you to even have the possibility to use this technology to create something like this or create whatever they want, and now your technology is being censored. So to anybody who's into uh, the, the, the media, into uh, making uh, fi firearms, not just making firearms, but making anything printable, I definitely think that you need to take this to heart and uh, stand up against these people who are trying to block your rights. Now let's move on to this. Baseball announcer advertises for Illuminati during game. Yeah, I have no idea what that means. Me neither. Apparently the, uh, the baseball gods did know. Oh, I bet they do. Uh, you, uh, what? What? Duh. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering myself. Yeah, just get yeah, this for the next nine two. Just be yeah, just talk about the number. The, uh, what? Yeah, I'm glad he said it because I wouldn't know how to articulate that either. Now, it, we did some checking on this, and that does turn out to be real. The guy's just out playing baseball, you know, a nice weekend playing baseball with the kids and everybody at the game and hot dogs and all that good stuff. And then they just throw up this, uh, yeah, throw up that, you know, just throw it up. Uh, as far as I know, there's no, been no real explanation as to how or why that made it on a national broadcast, but uh, yeah, just throw it up on screen and it's, it's all peachy keen. And we keep seeing this more and more. Let's go to our next article. InfoWars Nightly News, Madonna's New World Order Extravaganza at Super Bowl. Now, yeah, you can see it right there. And I do believe, what's that goat devil called? Baphoma? Is that what that's called? Baphomet. Baphomet. I don't keep up with that stuff, so I have to ask. Well, I'm not saying the guys are <laughs> worshippers or anything like that. Anyway, yeah, put, put that back up. I want people to see this. So she's wear, wearing the little devil horns and doing the little devil pose. And, you know, that's all well and good. You know, and they can throw up uh, 
demonic symbols and all seeing eyes during the the baseball game and that's all well and good but if you want to talk about you know christianity or even uh islam or whatever else uh that's politically incorrect because you may be insensitive to some people and i'm not you know bushing whatever religion but you know just keep that in mind but you, but you can do put that keep it yeah just leave that up there i want people to see this this is what's going on during the super bowl and this isn't even to talk about beyonce and all the weird stuff she had going on but there's madonna doing her nice little uh, goat devil pose so yeah that's uh that's what you get to see when you turn on your tv now now that's something that you see when you turn on tv but i turned on the internet today and i saw this video Police shoot dog defending owner as cops arrest him for what? Filming the police. Now you can see it right here. This is the gentleman. He was filming the police with his phone. Now he's putting his, uh, the dog in the car. And this is the police. They've arrested the man, put handcuffs on him. You can see the dog leaps out of the car, uh, approaches the police. And now you can see the police in just one second. They're going to draw down on the dog. And let's see. Let's watch here. Okay, now they've opened fire on the dog. The dog is hit. The dog is whirling around on the ground. And it's a, it's a very graphic video, and I should have warned you of that beforehand. And we took out the audio because there's a lot of profanity and uh, music in the background. But you can go to Infowars.com, and you can, hear, you can hear the gunshots when this dog is shot. You can hear the dog screaming and uh, see it wiggling in pain. And, uh, you know, the police are, I'm sure, going to say it's justified because the dog jumped out and approached them in an aggressive manner, which the dog did. But the dog approached them in an aggressive manner, be, uh, manner because they arrested its owner for doing something uh, that was filming the police, which is completely not illegal, uh, very much legal. So they did a wrong action, was approached by the dog. And now they're going to say, well, we had to shoot the dog because the dog attacked us for doing something that we shouldn't have been doing. And we see this more and more. We've seen it here in Austin, as a matter of fact. Austin, Texas police shoot dog dead, forced to undergo new training practices. You can see the dog right there. I think its name is Cisco. So this was a situation. An officer responds to a domestic abuse situation, uh, sees a man in the front yard playing with the dog. They, the officer immediately draws down on the man. Hey, guy, put your hands up in the air. The guy's like, I don't know what's going on. So the dog comes running, uh, approaches the officer, uh, supposedly in an aggressive member, manner. That could be uh, the case. But the dog approaches the officer. The officer draws down, shoots the dog. And now uh, at this point, after the officer shoots the dog, now the guy was like, what are you guys doing here? You know, he's like that at first. But then the officer's like, hold on. Like, uh, do you have a girlfriend? The guy's like, I, I live here by myself with my dog. Well, I guess he lives there by himself now because they shot the dog. And he's like, and, and the officer's like, I'm responding to a domestic situation. He's like, the only people who live here are me and my dog. And the officer goes, oh. And actually, if you go and watch that video on Infowars.com, you can see the officer shrug his shoulders. We're not going to show it right now for the sake of time. And the officer just kind of walks up like, oh, well, you know, I didn't, I'm sorry. I, I. The guy, the officer showed up at the wrong house. Let me help you out. The officer showed up at the wrong house, shot the guy's dog, walked off. And now they're saying, according to the Austin American Statesman, that Officer Griffin, that was the officer in the, in the video, received no discipline. So re received no discipline, walks up, shoots the guy's dog at the wrong address at the wrong address, walks off and uh, receives no discipline. That's what's going on. That's what's rotten in the city of Austin, Texas, and not just here. Also in the, uh, the previous article that we saw, there's a lot of police brutality, and it's not just limited to tasing people with seizures and so forth. We've shown you those videos as well. But they're shooting dogs for really no reason. Now, we're going to end tonight with this. School bans t bowing style post-game prayer following ACLU complaint. Now, for those, oh, let's, let's, let's come back to me for one second. I want to just talk to people. T-bowing is the act of getting down on one knee, and some people say they pray and, you know, T-bow prays or whatever, and that's his business. That's perfectly fine. I, when I was in high school, and I do believe I'm older than T-bow, uh, we got down on our knees just because Coach said get down on a knee. That's how we had meetings. Everybody would rush in, and Coach said take a knee. You get down on one knee. It's not necessarily praying. It's, we definitely didn't call it T-bowing or anything else. This is a situation, this was in Michigan, where the players had a, a post-game prayer. You know, they get together and they get down on one knee, take a knee, and they would pray. And the ACLU had a problem with this because they said we should have a separation of church and state. Now, you can argue that coaches and teachers and people like that shouldn't lead students in prayer, and if that's your argument, fine. But the, the prayer was started at least initially decades ago, as the article points out, about a decade ago, 
by a student. So a student said, you know, about 10 years or so ago, he said, hey, let's all get together, take a knee, you know, this is before Tebow, they said, let's take a knee and pray. And, you know, it's all well and good if a student doesn't, a student does it, but if a faculty member or whoever else does it, then that's a big deal. So, fine, if you don't want your faculty or anybody else doing it, but if it comes down to it, if the, the, just the students themselves want to bow down, take a knee and pray or do whatever, that's their business, do not infringe on the rights of the individual students. Now, that's all I have to say about that, but I have a whole lot to say about this. This, President Barack Obama, a man who flies around in private jets, escorted by military, which, you know, all presidents do. I don't have so much a problem with that. But he takes $7 million vacations, takes vacations by himself, gives his wife private vacations, sends his kids on private vacations. They live in, you know, just the, the champagne, swilling, caviar dreams kind of lifestyle. But he has the audacity to tell people in Africa, which I'm pretty sure we can all agree is pretty hot, that they should not have air conditioning or motorized vehicles. If everybody's raising living standards to the point where everybody's got a car and everybody's got air conditioning and everybody's got a big house, uh, well, the planet will boil over unless we find new ways of producing energy. Yeah, that is definitely not orderly to me to see uh, this man says, you should not have what I have. You know, I have, you know, a nice big house and I have air conditioning and I have a, uh, a bulletproof, bombproof car that I ride around in, but you can't have that because I had it first. That's essentially what this man's saying. He's saying if we raise the standard of living, not everybody can have the standard of living that we enjoy here in the States. Not everybody can have the standard of living that he enjoys, you know, because lo and behold, we all started to take $7 million vacations and maybe he can't get his private golf courses and stuff. I just want people to see that and see this is, this is what this man is up to. Hope and change. No, yeah, you can hope and change for, that you get somebody else who will actually allow you to have a car and, and air conditioning in your house. Who was that guy who said you can't take a hot bath? What was that Prince? It was Prince somebody. Oh, yeah, that Prince right there. Prince Charles. There he is. There he is uh, kissing up. You know, got his, uh, put his, yeah, scroll down to where the InfoWars is and he's in that costume. Yeah, look at him. That guy saying that you should not have a hot bath even though he dresses up like, uh, doesn't Michael Jackson, didn't he have a costume like that, Michael Jackson? It looks like a Michael Jackson costume to me, but uh, there you go. He says you should not have a hot bath, and President Obama says you should not have air conditioning. So these are the people uh, that you voted for, if you voted for him. Let's go now to our quote of the day. We'll end with this. If education is beaten by training, civilization dies. That by C.S. Lewis. Now, stay tuned. We have two very special interviews after this. We have one with Raymond Teague, who is in the Air Force and also has ties to the Apollo missions. You don't want to miss that. And also, Professor Griff in studio. He's here in Austin, so you don't want to miss that as well. But in the meantime, go to InfoWars.com. Go to the InfoWars shop. There it is right there. Pick up a copy of State of Mind at InfoWars shop exclusively at the InfoWars shop. So stay tuned right after this. We'll be back with Raymond Teague and also Professor Griff. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happened. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show. The education our children is, are going to get has nothing to do with education. It is training uh, our children to be uh, resources, human resources, that's the way they refer to us, to spin off profits for the globalists. The greatest barrier to discovery is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge, and that's what the 15,000 hours in compulsory schooling really entrains in, in and conditions into us, is that you've been told this story of the people in South America. And so you think you know about it. And it's not until later in life when you might come across more information about conquistadors and how Jesuits infiltrated all their religious systems and, and took all the riches out and basically harvested this whole area. And this is an example of plunder in South America that went on for hundreds of years. So until you have this other piece of information to bring this into focus, you think that what you were taught in public schooling during that 15,000 hours is really what's going on. And it's not until you bump up to, against reality, as George Orwell said, on a, usually on a battlefield, that you have to consider that which you were taught to believe versus the objective evidence that exists. John Taylor Gatto was an award-winning educator in New York who took kids that couldn't even read or write, were headed for prison, 
and made them top level students. And then he discovered that he was shut down by the big tax free foundations so that he couldn't teach the children this information. He discovered that it was by design that they were dumbing people down to make them subservient biological androids or replicants. That's what we're seen as. But now we're obsolete. We're going to be phased out the new robotic systems, the drone aircraft, the drone submarines, the drone ships, the drone robots on the ground. We're all being conditioned, all being acclimated for this. The important thing about the Pro One filter today is that the material we use for removing fluoride and other heavy metals now will remove the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. There's no other fluoride reduction filter out there that will remove that type of fluoride. And it's extremely important because Today, we're hearing more and more cities are using that form of fluoride. We've been having medication forced on us through the water system for quite a while. Most people don't realize it. Most people don't realize the negative effects of fluoride. There's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. Bottom line, why should somebody get this new Pro One Pro Pure filter? The reason to buy the Pro One, it's an all-in-one filter. It's convenient, easy to use. It doesn't require the add-on fluoride filter. And in addition, this filter removes the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. Our first guest tonight is Raymond Teague. He is a retired Air Force member and actually worked on several Apollo projects. He's going to tell us the project in his own words. Here he is right now in studio. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Teague. You're welcome. All right. Now, you were talking today on the Alex Jones radio show about your history, and I'll do, do you a disservice if I try to quote all of it myself. So can you tell our viewers out there who may not have caught the segment what your history is with NASA? Uh, in reality... I don't want to make the NASA mad at me. I was never a member of NASA. Okay. I was badged. I was an Air Force officer assigned to the program, working in the Air Force, working on the NASA project or on Apollo project, but I was not a government employee. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, a, a fine detail. And then after that, while well, I worked in in an intelligence uh, Air Force intelligence shop, and then. After that, after Vietnam, I got laid off from the Air Force, and I went to work for Lockheed, two different Lockheed companies, and after all that ran out, I, <clears throat> I worked for some uh, solid-state manufacturers in Austin mm -hmm. that has its own set of tall tales and problems. Okay. rumors and so forth. Uh, one of the things you don't recognize or, or people aren't aware of is in solid state of <clears throat> if you're building integrated circuits you're etching silicon well silicon is a glass and it's pretty impervious to everything so <clears throat> using fluorine and nitric sulfuric acids and various combinations of uh, solutions you have a very dangerous toxic situation and the vats that these are transferred one another in clean rooms and the room has to be ultra clean because even the tiniest speck of dust on an integrated circuit ruins the whole circuit. I mean, it may not ruin the whole wafer, but which you may have either a few large or hundreds of tiny circuits on a disk. Right. Uh, any contamination at all ruins it. Ruins that. Particular device. particular device. Now, sir, if we get back to the uh, Apollo, the actual mission, okay, or unless you had a. Let a point me tell you, you what the rest of this is. So, you can wind up with driving past these semiconductor uh, houses, and you are likely to see a whole parking lot full of people that are dressed in clean room clothes with their boots and uh, the whole gown, <coughs> acid resistant gowns on. And the reason what has happened is the air conditioning, they have huge blowers on uh, these rooms to keep the um, acid fumes blown out of it. And if you get caught in there very long, well, you'll wind up a dead person. Right. 
So as soon as the alarms go off, you throw everything down, you don't take your clothes off or anything, you run. And they have a reassembly area in the parking lots where everybody goes so they can keep track and make sure everybody got out. And uh, I've had that happen a number of times. Now, do they have any kind of decontamination if something like that happens? Do they have any uh, process to, to help no, people? No, you're, you're <clears throat> the only thing you do, get out in the open air. Then you can take your uh, clean room clothes off. And when going back in, those are now dirty. So you throw those in the re-clean re um, hamper and um, put on new booties, suit, coveralls, hood, everything you need, mask. Uh, to go back in the clean room. And um, yeah, there is a decontamination. Then you go through a decontamination, the air blow off to, and to, uh, yeah. this goes along with uh, the space program in that you're operating in an artificial atmosphere and there are controlled conditions, and if something goes wrong, your life is in immediate danger if you don't do the right things. Oh, yeah. All right, getting back to what we were talking about on Apollo 13. When on Apollo 13, <clears throat> I happened to be at the end of my normal shift, uh, and when the when something happened, we didn't know what it was until much later. And uh, but it was very serious. All electric power was lost, or not all. Only a few circuit breakers remained. Uh, closed on <clears throat> the Apollo command capsule for th Apollo 13, and the, the rest of it, um, the, these circuit breakers powered the telemetry systems that allowed the ground controllers to see what the status was of all the different systems, and this included life support systems of all type, for instance, that control the amount of CO2 that was allowed in the air and the amount of the oxygen pressure. Mm -hmm. Um, and they didn't dare th just throw them back on because we might have had an uncontrolled fire and in those conditions, a little bit of that would have been the end of them. Yeah, not to mention they don't have a, a large area to separate in. That's right. So, um, and also we had, during Apollo, for all these missions, there were books of emergency procedures, just like if you are familiar with an aircraft, if you're flying an aircraft, you have emergency procedures, and if something goes wrong, you turn to the procedure you've got on your knee, a flip through a, a book mm -hmm. that tells you the steps you're to take to recover. Right. Well, that was an Apollo, this was endless, and at the same time, this event was totally unplanned, of course, and uh, they didn't know what to do about gaining it back. Well, I happened to the group I was with, the guidance and uh, control system, our breakers did not blow or had been, we would have been done for. Mm -hmm. But um, so they had the navigation system up and this gave us time to sit and listen and observe and analyze and pray, right. uh, trying to figure out what was wrong while everybody else was pulling their hair out trying to figure out what their systems was, do, was doing with no data. Now, what was your first thought when this happened? You know, what was your first hunch or, you know, what was the group's hunch that something had gone wrong? What did you guys think it was? Well, <clears throat> we didn't know, but it was serious. It, this was just after a telecast that had been done on the, in the lunar module, and the, uh, the lunar module and the command module were coupled together by two rings that were that fitted together and uh, held the craft together, and they were just large enough to move from one uh, capsule to the other. Okay, from the lunar module to the uh, the uh, command module, which was the transport between the Earth and the Moon. And they had just were closed. They hadn't closed it out. They hadn't put the stops back in yet, which is one of the things that saved us. Save the 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 crew and the mission, or save the crew. Anyway, since our system was working, we had time to pay attention to what everybody else was doing. And when they started resetting breakers a few at a time, or they got down to, um, they found out that they had almost no oxygen left or in these tanks and had no power. Well, they would we. Powered things back up. They got the telemetry back. 
discovered that uh, there was very little time left to do anything, electric power left to, uh, to keep the system going. And this was a, called a non-free return. They were in a trajectory that would have intersected the moon had it, they remained going the way they were going. Instead of going around the moon. Instead of going around the moon. So we had to do a very quick uh, burn or, or use the rocket. We wound up using the rockets on the lunar module because it didn't dare know what would happen if we tried to fire the um, a command module, a service module uh, motor. But in order to do this, we had to get the two aligned. Well, normally we would have taken three readings between these rings and um, averaged them out and um, got the lunar module coupled to the uh, command module and so that the data that was in the gyroscopic or nav system that was on the command module would match that on the lunar module. Mm -hmm. And that was absolutely necessary. To, when you were separate, to go into lunar, you normally would have done that going into orbit around the, the moon. But we had to do it right then. And even then, in order to keep the, um, the system going, they had to chain, uh, switch to the uh, reentry batteries. Well, if you ran the reentry batteries all the way down, you wouldn't be able to reenter mm -hmm. because you wouldn't be able to control the jets to keep the heat shield forward into going into the atmosphere. And uh, so we accomplished that. They did a quick, they did the burn. Then we, all, everything was shut down. Everything was powered down that could be powered down, including almost all the fans and so forth. It was then that we found out that, uh, well, the only way to keep the CO2 levels that have a, um, at a level that uh, could be used, I mean, that the astronauts could survive in, right. was to <clears throat> uh, use the oxygen absorbing canisters that were in the lunar module. And in order to do that, they had to rig up a cardboard assembly and it would duct tape to blow the... Duct tape? Yeah, they had duct yeah. tape on board. They had... Because what the... Um, the systems people did, they had, you know, buildings where all this was tested and, and had been built, and they spent all night uh, coming up with things that could be done by with what they had on board Right. to put this together. Now, I'll interrupt your story briefly. Now, how probable was this scenario before, before the launch, you know, when you guys were prepping and trying to get ready for possible scenarios that could go wrong? Was this one of the top ones, or... Where did, did it fall? Every simulation that was done was to solve problems, systems problems. But nothing like this was ever simulated because it was not envisioned. This was something that was not survivable. Something they never thought would happen. Never or thought you wouldn't would happen, even no. survive it if it did. No. Uh, and uh, what had happened was there was a thermostat in the liquid oxygen tank the liquid oxygen was boiled off as a vapor, and in order to get it to boil, uh, provide enough vapor to um, to run the fuel cells, you had to to heat it up, which was done with what amounted to something that looked like a water tank, electric water tank heater, okay. and they had a thermostat on that, and they had a stirrer also. But uh, they um, anyhow, the point stuck on this and caused the pressure to rise in the tank to where it failed. The tank exploded and um, just by overpressure. And when that did, why well, it blew one of the quarter panels off, a whole quarter section off of the command module that this was the light support system, all the, and propulsion systems were all built in this uh, rocket right. that was underneath, that the command module sat on top Mm. And uh, so we didn't know how much damage had been done, what had been damaged. So we didn't dare light that one up. Right. And as far as what had happened, the crew looked out and they could see all this stuff, insulation and parts and pieces, bits of material floating around outside the windows. 
So they knew something very adverse had happened, but nobody knew exactly what until they figured out that the oxygen tank had blown up. So you're trying to figure this out on the ground. They're trying to figure it out you know, yes, in the atmosphere. Normally, uh, everything on the, almost every thing imaginable on the command module was telemetered to the ground so that you had a readout on almost everything. But when you lost the electric power, then all this visibility went away to where we were blind, didn't know what had happened. Right. Now, I'm not sure if it was in reference to this one on the Alex Jones radio show, you were talking about that you were at some point fed some false information. Is that correct? No, no. Uh, oh, a different subject. Any, okay. Anyhow, to get, yeah. get past Apollo 13. Um, the, the burn was successful. The trajectory was changed to a fly around the moon and back. We did have to make another burn on the way back because the corridor of safety to hit the Earth's atmosphere was only about 20 miles deep. If you were, and when you're a quarter of a million miles away, 20 miles is a very small hole at the end of that that you had to be in. So that was another quite a, I won't go into it, but anyhow, it was figured out by some of the people I work with how to do it with what they had on board, how to get it the, the guidance package on the lunar module aligned to where they could successfully make this maneuver, and it was done. Right. Okay. Now, what I was talking about, for this to all been faked, or it could have been done, but you would have had, uh, you talk about some science fiction writers that would to come up with all the problems that actually went on uh, would have been virtually zero impossible. Um, and as I said, I worked with a Russian engineer much later, years later, and um, he assured me that it was faked, that we did not go to the moon. This is what somebody told you, a Russian engineer told you yes, it was faked. right. And my experience later in life on other things indicated to me that it was at least possible. I believe we went to the moon. I believe that everything happened through Apollo 17 that was supposed to. But then there were other things happened. For instance, there were many other things. I won't go into all of it. But they canceled the, they destroyed the tooling and the drawings to make the Saturn V heavy lift rocket. And now the Russians are flying stuff for us because we don't have anything that will do it. Mm. And the shuttle could not replace that. They don't have, you don't have the heavy lift capability with the shuttle to put up large payloads. It just wasn't built big enough to do it. And... Um, this was highly suspicious to me, and I said, why in the world would you destroy our capability of flying heavy payloads into space? Now, back when I was, when uh, all this science fiction started, when back when I was in middle school, high school, I saw one pro program, it was called Destination Moon, where a rocket was built. And they went up and they built a space station and then flew to the moon from there. Mm -hmm. But the space station was built in the form of a wheel that spun around and you lived on the outside and walked on the outside. That was a floor to give you artificial gravity. Okay. Well, this is still a big problem and why it wasn't done with the um, fuel tanks we threw away on every one of them on, um, on Apollo, I mean, not on Apollo, on um, <coughs> the shuttle, mm -hmm. that enormous fuel tank, a few more feet per second would keep it in orbit and you could actually build a large space station out of that we talked about it, suggested it, and so forth. It wasn't done. But to have built a sensible space station that a man could stay on for a long time, you would need gravity. They would need some sort of artificial means of, mm. of having a simulation of gravity. Yeah, otherwise, their bodies will deteriorate. Otherwise, their muscle tone, their blood circulation, everything is affected. In fact, if you've been in space a long time and you land back on the ground, you're kind of like a jellyfish. They have to fish you out of the... They gotta go there and pull and, you out of yeah, there. Pull you out and get you back on your, in a wheelchair and until <clears throat> you can get back up to where you can keep yourself going because with no, 
whenever when you have no artificial gravity after especially if you're up for months then you're you're so weak you can't do anything exactly now i want to go back to a point that you made earlier you were talking about how uh, you were talking to the russian engineer and they said that you know this thing is faked uh, and you said you know you're at least open to the possibility is that correct that's correct the okay. russians i worked with later on years later um told me that we really didn't go to the moon and you know i gave them the reasons why i thought we did but they still weren't convinced something else that surprised me that uh, they told me that well in the plant i worked in there was a lunch room with a microwave oven mm -hmm. and so you're not allowed to have that in russia we don't have microwave ovens they're illegal in russia in russia oh okay i didn't know well that. i was surprised to learn that and uh, later on they were accepted i think they now have microwave ovens but the deal with the microwave oven is that the food you cook in them is very bad for you for instance, if you take water and boil it in a microwave oven, and even though you aerate it later to, to cool it off and, and get it back to ambient temperature, if you put fish in it, for instance, they will die. They will, cannot live in my, in microwave right. oven. Well, if the fish won't live in, can't live in the water you've microwaved, what happens to your food when you ingest it? Mm -hmm. This cannot be good. Yeah, yeah, and not to mention all the preservatives and other things in the food. Well, what I do personally is I do use a microwave oven, but I never cook anything in a microwave oven. If I have to run it for more than a minute or so to get a batch heated up, I put it in an ordinary dish on a conventional electric stove. I don't do it in a microwave oven. Right. They're great for warming things up where you can do it in 30 seconds or so, and that way you don't convert chemically all the liquid and everything in it to something else that you're not supposed to be eating. Right. But back to the uh, to the launch, you know, was there any information that you thought was uh, damning one way or the other that convinced you one way or the other? It makes you think that the launch did happen or did not happen? No, they, <clears throat> I saw, I personally witnessed one of the launches. Oh, yeah, or one of the uh, space missions. That'd yes. probably be more accurate. Um, but, you know, after you launch and you see it go out of sight, you don't know what happens after that. Well, um, but we have all these other things going on. One of the things that, that is on the plus side that we really went to, anything you could, uh, as an engineer on the program, anything you could do during the mission to help if you weren't doing something else while you would get assigned to do something. And one of them was on Apollo 12. On Apollo 11, size, size monitors and our, um, a corner reflector array was set on that if you shine the light on it, it you would get it shined back just like on these reflectors on the cars or actually little diamonds inside the the lenses if you shine a light on it it, it no matter how, how the light has come from it's reflected back to the source right well this these several packages like that were left on the moon on apollo 11 well apollo 12 uh the top stage, the what was called the S-4B, the final rocket that uh, was used for part of the propulsion to get to the moon, you had to take the command module off, turn it around, and attach it to the lunar module, and extract that out of the top of the S-4B. But that was left as junk. Well, it was decided they were, instead of sending it to the sun or someplace, they would crash it into the moon and see what the uh, vibration, what type of vibration was put in. Okay. <clears throat> well, this was done with strip chart recorders. They were a long piece of gear with needles like you used to see on these earthquake um, uh, instruments that mm -hmm. uh, give you the level of an earthquake. And... Um, I was had to be taught hastily how to load the paper and uh, change paper and ink and so forth on a strip chart recorder. So I became the operator of the strip chart recorders. You know, this was only an hour out of Apollo 12. Uh, well, Mr. Tig, we're just about out of time. Is there uh, any uh, final thoughts you'd like to leave it, us with? Anyway, the strip chart recorders, when the, after this, uh, I forgot how much the S4B weighed, but it hit. I think at approximately 5,000 
miles an hour into the surface of the moon. The moon rang like a bell for the next 30 minutes. The needle swept from one side of the chart to the other, and this went on, and it finally tapered off, but it went on for 30 minutes that uh, the reflection from the surface went from one, to, you know, would be reflected off the back side of the moon and back, and it, uh, uh, that was unexpected that we would see anything like that. Right. And I actually operated that system, so I know it was there and it existed. But, uh, but you don't know about everything else, but you can at least personally attest for that. Well, there are a number of things that I can attest to that, yes, it looks like we did go to the moon. Uh, Put a man on the moon. Yes. Mm. And, uh, but why that, uh, like I said, probably the, uh, the surface photography with the Hasselblad cameras was fake because the radiation more than likely fogged the film to the point where it was virtually worthless by the time we got it back on the surface, back to the, to the labs to the, on yeah, the surface. Okay, that's a very good point, very good point. All right, well, Mr. Teague, I'm sorry we're out of time and we have to move on to the rest of the show, but I definitely appreciate you for sitting in with us and also uh, being on the Alex Jones radio show. You're quite welcome. All right, thank you, sir. All right, now that's it for this portion of the interview. We also have another interview with Alex Jones and Professor Griff right after this. But first, stop by the InfoWars shop and pick up the new July magazine. This has the big glossy bumper stickers and all that right there in the magazine. So stop by the InfoWars shop and pick up that. Now stay tuned for Alex Jones and Professor Griff. Now you can watch the InfoWars nightly news streaming live as it happens for free. Check it out at InfoWars.com forward slash show. Johnny Appleseed was born during the Revolutionary War. He's not just a legend. And in more than five states, he introduced apples that had not even been grown in the colonies. Later, the seeds from plants he planted and cultivated and some of the varieties he developed spread across the United States. And it was Johnny Appleseed teaching the colonists and then the new Americans after we won independence the love of planting fruit trees that introduced that idea to North America. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a revolutionary act to unplug from the television, to unplug from the computer and all the globalist propaganda and to go out in your backyard or your front yard or planters at your apartment or on the roof of the building where you live and to plant a garden. Become the Johnny Appleseed of your community with seeds from the InfoWars Seed Center at InfoWarsStore.com. The simple act of planting fruits and vegetables and then tending them and taking care of them and then sharing them with friends and family is a revolutionary act against tyranny. The globalists, first and foremost, do not want us to be self-sufficient. The crony anti-free market capitalist, the fascist, are using socialism and collectivism to shut down societies. Stalin in Poland and in Ukraine and other areas starved on record more than 10 million people over five years by not letting them grow their own crops and collectivizing them. Mao killed between 65 million and 80 plus million people doing this same thing. The UN says they will use food as a weapon. They use genetic evil to attack the earth and major GMO companies have been caught going into growth belts around the world, even where GMO is illegal, and planting seeds everywhere to infect the genetics of the original crops. Almost all of the thousands of varieties of Mexican corn has been infected. They are in a genetic war against everyone. That's why we have to get these seeds and not just plant them on our own gardens and not just give them as gifts to friends and family to plant spring and summer and fall gardens. I'm calling on you to go out into the green belts, to go out into the areas and plant secret gardens. No, not of marijuana, but of the hundreds and hundreds of incredible high quality uh, vegetables and herbs and fruit plants that are here. 
lemons and oranges, the list goes on and on. They will grow uh, plum trees, grape trees. They will grow almost everywhere in the U.S. We can literally, not just buying these products from InfoWarsStore.com, but from wherever you get them. This aggressive program literally just came to me one morning when I woke up about 4 a.m. realizing that we've got to counter their genetic war against us with original, real crops developed over eons on this planet. We have the lowest prices we bought it in the biggest bulk that some of these companies have ever seen to ship this directly to you from the InfoWars Command Center. We stand for life. We stand for liberty. We stand for self-sufficiency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com, click on the Seed Center, and as of taping this, we have the seven top respected brands. We intend to continue to do research and find other companies, other specialties, other varieties to really take action. The InfoWars Store Seed Center has the largest online selection of heirloom, non-GMO seeds. Check out these products from our newest supplier, Heirloom Organics. The Medicine Garden, for a natural remedy. The Tea Garden, that contains every important tea herb you can grow. Fruit lovers, with 12 varieties. And the Tobacco Pack, additive and pesticide free. Join the gardening revolution today at InfoWarsStore.com. This is a revolutionary action we're asking you to take. Plant seeds everywhere today. Nurture them, bring them to fruit, and pass on the knowledge to others. Become human again. Discover your roots in the soil. And remember, the revolution against tyranny is growing. <laughs> And welcome back to the conclusion of this very special Tuesday edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Uh, great job, Jakari Jackson and Raymond Teague in the news and interview portion earlier. Just bombshell info from inside uh, Air Force Intelligence and NASA with Raymond Teague. Hope you realize it took a lot of doing to get Raymond to come in here and talk about what he did tonight, but especially what he covered on the radio today. That is uh, some real important info uh, right there. Wow, I feel like I know him growing up listening to his music. And following what he does, and we put out the Obama deception, he'd plug it at packed concerts to 50,000 people, and then interviewing him in the last few years over the phone. It is even more incredible to be able to meet Professor Griff, Army veteran, uh, founder of Public Enemy, the uh, Minister of Information, uh, here with us today, a man who has a lot of courage and who is also a survivor. So I wanted to talk to you today, sir. Thank uh, great you. to yes, Great sir. to have you here with us. All right about how we ended the radio today, running out of time. Right. You, you were bringing up solutions, mm -hmm. and we're definitely saying, what do you think a solution is, Alex? Do you think it's getting people in media and entertainment to start telling the truth? You know that is the big solution. That's why the system spends so much time trying to block that. Right. So looking out there at the people, you've got the floor, the call to arms in the info war. What does Professor Griff say to the young people out there about whether it's hip-hop or rock and roll or whatever it is, how they're crafting it to be a destructive message when we could lead a new revolution against the globalist uh, by really uh, talking about what's happening in this world. So, Professor Griff, you didn't know I was going to do this, but what is the state of free humanity versus the new world order right now? And what do you say to people out there? I think um, in owning your own, um, your own mind and your own thoughts is going to be, quote unquote, the new wave. We don't even own our own thoughts. A lot of the things that we discuss that we extract from the dirt sheets, these newspapers, be they digital online um, or, or offline, um, from sound bites, from commercials. And these are the things that we use um, to pull from to have these discussions. I say, scrap that. We got to dig deeper and dig the truth out of some of these stories that we're hearing on the nightly news to extract the real truth so we can make a difference now. If we're not going to become infomaniacs, if we're not going to become info warriors, if we're not going to be truth tellers, then what is it that we're going to do to put in place as a foundation to survive? We're not talking about going to eat lunch or going to the party or doing whatever. We're talking about survival from this point um, forward. So as an army veteran, as we talked earlier, I went to the army simply because I didn't really have a choice. Street, couldn't afford college. I'm too damn short to be a basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never asked to be a rapper. It kind of chose me. I kind of figured, well, let me go make something of myself. You know, sitting at home between the cartoons and the uh, 
and, and the stories that you watch on, on, on TV and the program that you watch on TV, you get that Army commercial? Well, it hit me, and I said, well, maybe I can make something of myself in the United States uh, military. I went in as um, military police, ended up coming out as a 95 Charlie, which is a correctional specialist, but hated every single minute of it. Uh, the injections, the vaccinations that you're forced to take, um, the slight mind control, brainwashing, stripping you down, making you a, a killer of sorts, um, and then and, and, um, thinking that you're being trained to perform a certain function in society once you get out of the military is absolutely ludicrous and farce. It's a farce simply because um, a correctional specialist. I was trained to shoot, kill, stay in shape, and this kind of thing, to serve America on domestic and, and foreign shores. But when I got out of the military with an honorable discharge, mind you, wasn't able to find a job, found myself right back in the hood. And that's when the public enemy thing kicked in because I said maybe I could tell this particular truth using the medium of hip hop. So if young people are watching this and they're listening, number one, accept your own and be yourself and be as real as possible. Tell the story the way you want to tell the story, regardless of the situation and the circumstances. Um, I hear a lot of cats in the street now. You see them, one of these cats. Yeah, son, I'm just keeping it real. Well, how real are you keeping it? We're keeping it real. But a lot of times when we keep it real, they don't keep it this real. A lot of them uh, know the truth but fail to tell the truth because of their contract. And as you know, as I explained on your show before, a lot of them are signing uh, these 360 deals, meaning that if you made an album, Alex, and your album came out and we took this circle, we cut it up into an eight piece pie, everything that you make money from your album, I don't care if it's merchandise, live shows, endorsement deals, whatever. All right. The record company gets a piece of everything that you do. It now owns life. you. Exactly. But listen, forever. This is why Prince had to wear slave on his face. Simply because, uh, and he had to change his name to the artist formerly known as, because they owned his name. Wow. They owned his likeness. They owned everything until he made enough money to buy it back. By the way, I've noticed he's made comments about the chemtrails in the New World Order. Uh, it because, seems like he's awake. Because he's free. He's not bound, and bo bound by, by the contract anymore. But the young cats are coming up as not as smart as you, you and I and Prince. They're signing these 360 deals away, and they're signing their entire lives away because now... They have ownership of your contract and your, and your IP and your material for domestic, foreign, international, universe, and now the contract says galaxy. I've seen that. And this is ridiculous. These young cats don't know what a damn galaxy is, much less um, what they're signing, these 85, 95 page contracts that they don't know how to read. But they're trusting lawyers, and the lawyers have already took the oath. And, and working with the record companies. So that's what I would like to tell young people. You think it's glitz and glamour all the time? You think you're going to be rich and you're famous? And it's far from that. It, it's far from that. Well, just to my own self, getting to go to a lot of big Hollywood parties and meet some of those famous people out there, they're in prison. They're totally unhappy. Exactly. And, and most of Hollywood says we're supposed to keep it left or right. It's basically a mafia runs this. And basically, if you don't get into one of these weird cults, mm -hmm. Basically, the cults you talked about, you're shut down, and, and, and you've seen actors talk about how there's a mafia killing actors. Yep. I mean, this is really going on. Very, very, very real. Why would Martin Lawrence run down Hollywood Boulevard, Wilshire Boulevard, Sunset Boulevard, waving a gun, screaming? Someone's after him. Why would Dave Chappelle hand back a $50 million check? Why would Beyonce still be taking her clothes off at damn near 35, 40 years old? They signed on the dotted line. They've taken the oath. And these, some of these things they have to do just to stay alive in the music industry. And this is very real. If we look at some of the contracts, and matter some of the things that they do is based on some of the contracts they've signed and they've signed their lives away. Let me raise this point. I know you've got to run into a show here in just a little while tonight, uh, an already sold out show. Uh, looking at this, we don't really have a culture anymore, whether it's American culture, black culture, white culture, whatever it is. Anytime I research a culture, whatever the original culture was, I love it. It's real people. Right, it's right, based on right. common sense. Mm -hmm. It's based on a history. It's great. It's this plastic, fake, poisonous culture. The globalists say on record to wreck people's minds yeah. so they can be dominated and controlled for a master plan of the future where we don't even exist in it.
So how do you get that message across to people that feel so enslaved that they're not rich, they're not powerful, when for those of us that have had a chance to be up on top of the mountain, it's not like anything even good to sell out for. Right, right, right. I have to, it's almost like I have to learn a new language. You know, I'm 52 years old, I'm somebody's granddad. Talk to, speak to that generation, you have to have courage, you have to have the information, and, and you have to be able to at least speak to them on their level. To tell them that there's another world out there waiting for you to bring your talents to exploit you, they don't believe it. That language is in the contracts. They're exploiting your name, your likeness, and your talents so you can make money. But that was the old contracts. Now the new contracts, it basically says the same thing, but they're the ones that's going to make the money long after you're dead and gone. Now listen, they have this new thing out now, these holograms. I've seen Tupac holograms. I've seen a few other artists. And I've been telling the people ever since I've been on your show that they're going to start having hologram uh, live shows where no real people are going to be there performing. It's all going to be hologram. No, no, no. They already have Prince Charles won't go to events now. He appears via hologram. And they're going to have a hologram president now mm -hmm. where they can fill the teleprompter and the computer right. makes it sound just like Barack Obama. Exactly. Very dangerous. Exactly. So, and, and, and knowing that, our children will be showing up at concerts watching people that have been dead and gone for years. So they'll really own you forever, and then they can put whatever they want in your mouth. Forever, and bring you back when they want to bring well, you that's back for whatever more, purpose. That's a more fancy version of what the press does, where they're always taking what I say, and not even taking it out of context. They will say, Alex says Obama sent the tornado exactly. to Oklahoma. Exactly. No, a caller said, do they have weather weapons? I said, yes, they do. This probably isn't that. Right. That turns into, I said Obama sent a tornado to make <laughs> me sound crazy. In the future, they can just show a, a, an image of Alex Jones right. saying whatever they want. Or when they want to foster a war in some, some place on, on the planet, all they have to do is bring back Tupac or Biggie, bring back Heavy D or Big L, bring back James Brown, Don Cornelius or one of these cats, make the commercial using the hologram, and get people to join the military to go. Here's an example, the Iraq war. They showed the daughter of the ambassador from Kuwait, who, mm -hmm. who was not in Kuwait, it came out it was all lies, right. saying Saddam threw babies out of incubators and basically wow. stomped their brains out. And they said that they weren't going to say her name, they are going to play a clip of this, we're not going to say her name uh, for her safety, it right. was all fake, just like they said Gaddafi was raping women with Viagra, that wasn't true. Wow. They always put out, uh, you know, the, the Spanish blew up the main to get us in the Spanish-American right. right. war. Right. It turns out it's all a false flag, but do you think people, we're going to play that clip, here's a clip of that. Our final witness is also using an assumed name, and again, we ask uh, our friends in the media to respect the need to, for her to protect her family. And we finally call on Naira to testify. I volunteered, volunteered at the Aladan Hospital with 12 other women who wanted to help as well. I was the youngest volunteer. The other women were from 20 to 30 years old. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers g come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators, took the incubators, and left the children to die on the cold floor. That was horrifying. I could not help but think of my nephew, who, if born premature, might have died that day as well. Professor Griff, you just saw that clip, a blast from the past back in 1990. Right. That was used to launch a war that now, 20 years later, has killed over a million and a half Iraqis. Right. British Medical Journal. That lie sold lie. Right. a million and a half real dead people, right. most of them kids. Exactly. So, I think the movie Wag the Dog spoke to this. And I think once we start seeing it in popular culture, popular entertainment, and once they put it on the small and big screen, know that we're 10 years behind them. They've already pulled these things up in the quote-unquote theater of war. And as you mentioned, a million people lost their lives. And we have to understand these particular dynamics. It's very, very real. You see, we throw the term around keeping it real. We, we, we throw it around so much, it's almost like, you know, we, kinda, we just kind of say it in, in you know, this passe kind of kind of way, but it's, it's very real. And a lot of times when we watch the news and we, we try to extract uh, bits and pieces uh, of the truth, from the news, we failed to put it and in, in, incorporate it into the songs, into the live show, because 
we feel like we're not we're not worthy of that. We not we don't have enough. I was about to say I study this 18 hours a day. Right. It's so overwhelming. How do you take people raised on pure lies and decipher something that big? I mean, it's so over. I mean, I mean here's an example. They've had Russian troops here training for 20 years. Right. Now they're admitting Russian troops are going to patrol America. And and people are like, okay. I mean, it's just, it's all, but then American troops are going to patrol there. It's this new world corporate government where they're exempt from taxes. They're, ex right. they're God, we're nobody. But Alex, if you're fed these particular things to soften you up through the video games, through the movies, through the music. That's it. Um, you, you, you're there. You, 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 we, they have you open. And now, to actually pull it off, we think we're on the video game. We think this is not real. This That's it. They're blurring the fantasy world with the holograms, the video games, exactly. with reality, so that once it really happens, nobody knows what's... Let me ask this in closing. If it was a football game between free humanity and the team New World Order, mm. who do you think is going to end up uh, winning this thing? I mean, what does your gut tell you? My gut tell me the free-thinking people will prevail simply because how long can you keep the lie going? What else is it, what new trick that you have to come up with to keep the lie going? Um, I think free-thinking people will win simply because um, I think we have the wherewithal. I think. I think once once we tap into the self, we tap into this 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 wealth of knowledge that I that I know we have and that's that's out there. You know, there's not enough tricks and lies and games that these people could come up with. Absolutely, but we have to understand it, know it, and I'm going for it in my lifetime. Regardless of what I have to suffer, what comes against me, I'm going for it. I'd rather die that kind of death than to, to live um, this lie than to live. Um, this life that someone else has kind of carved out for me that I'm not really living. When I studied earlier, uh, earlier this morning, I was studying what I had for breakfast. I pushed it away from me. It was at the hotel. I don't want to mention what hotel. I pushed it away from me. And I, is this genetically modified food? Is this real food that I'm eating? And then it made me think, how am I going to sustain my life if I not only find out the real truth spiritually, if I not um, enhance, exactly. enhance my intellect, and then I got to put... Real food, living food in a living body. So I'm pushing the, the, the cornflakes and the banana and the muffin away from me, saying to myself, I just can't do it. I'm tired of eating at these hotels, exactly. getting on the bus, feeling sick. You know what you just said that's so incredibly heavy? I know people that go to foreign countries where there's no GMO in mm -hmm. Eastern European places, and they eat like pigs and drink, and they lose weight because it's not the GMO. They've done studies on pigs and things right. and other farm animals. They feed them the GMO. They get sick, fat, and die. But here's the thing. I know all this, and I can't stop giving it to my kids. Even, I mean, I've cut back. I go out, and I'm hungry, and they just give it to me, and none of us question. And when you start questioning everything, right. you see how deep the prison is. Yes. And, you, and what you said about you're committed. You know, to us, keeping it real is not we're cooler than other people, right, right, and right. we've decided to go against this. We've seen the other side. We realize it's a con. It's death. Exactly. The only thing you can do is pull away from it, and even when you totally are aware of it, I I'm a slave. I can't even get out of it all. Right. I'm letting them kill my kids. Right. I mean, so how do I make a total break? How do any of us out there watching do that when it's so overwhelming? I think we totally make a break with it, just like you just said. Exactly. Once you follow the yellow brick road and you end up and you figure out who's behind the curtain, once you discover that, how do you act? How do you conduct yourself? Now we know that this guy is controlling everything, pushing the buttons and the levers. We pull the curtain back. How do you conduct yourself? You have to have information to do that, plain and simple. I think you withdraw your consent from them. You don't buy anything from them. You vote with your dollars while that power is still left. Because I would say they're about 80% into their program. If I had to draw this out. They're about 80% into their program. And you know, the New World Order is where they're going. And we're about right here. Right. But they're st now they've gotten here, but it took them longer and it's gotten where it's an uphill battle. It seems insurmountable, but if we all just start resisting, it'll snowball and push them back. Exactly. And I think though that what they've got going for them is that it's so overwhelming how evil it is. That, 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 A, people can't believe it's this bad, even though they know it, part of it's true, and B, they feel powerless. But what they've got to realize is, in all the Hollywood movies, they show it as one guy beats the bad guys. Right. And they, they don't think of themselves as the Schwarzenegger or the, you know, Denzel right. Washington or whoever right. beating everybody. Well, you've got to realize it's actually billions, billions of us right. that are in this fight. And all of us doing a little bit together will move mountains, especially when the bureaucrats and people 
and the, and, the, and the enforcers realize, even if they're evil, they're not actually on the winning team. Right. They've been conned. But we better speak up while we have the chance. I agree. Give us the websites. Publicenemies.com and pgriff.info. That's www.publicenemy.com and www.pgriff.info. Okay, now this interview is going to end, and I'm always running on at the mouth. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything else you'd like to throw out at people? No, we're good. Then my last question, who else is awake who isn't public uh, out there that you know that, that understands what's going on? I mean, obviously KRS-One's been on the show. He knows what's <laughs> going on. He helped influence you. Uh, you, were, you were telling me some of the other guys you know that are, that, that are awake we're, but don't want to go public. Yeah, but I hope they don't get me for this. But the, the, the Andre 3000s of the world from Outkast, they, they, they're awake. You know, there's, there's some uh, the Erica Badu's of the world. They're awake. They know um, how they have to get small bits, degrees of truth out is really an artistic thing for them, and I leave that up to them. But I know these people, you know, um, CeeLo Green, a couple of guys from New Edition. These guys are awake and aware. They, they, they know. Ron Bevel of New Edition is a good friend of mine. I feed them information all the time. They're aware of you, your show, and your work. Um, we got called by a really famous icon of icons, right. and we're, we're, we're working on getting him on the show. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've put the call out, and I've just said, it's time if you know what's going on, you better do something. Right. doesn't mean save the world. Right, right, right. doesn't mean mission impossible. Yeah, you, sound, you sound like me. <laughs> I, I mean, we've all got to do just something, something. and together it's going to bring it down. Right, exactly. So these guys are awake and aware, but they understand the opposition because they understand what happened to me. Getting kicked out of public enemy, getting poisoned. And these kind of things. So they know what they're up against. Uh, but I tell them, look, I'm still standing. They have to do a little bit more than that. Anyway. i got to throw one more thing in at you here, and I know you got to go. It's just so great to have you here in person, and we appreciate it. Professor Griff, founder of Public Enemy, here with us. What do you say to the New World Order? I mean, I know they're going to move forward with their plan, but I've talked to some of their children, some of their physicians. A lot of people in their own system are getting cold feet about how evil this is, but they're not the ones that are promoted to the very top positions. But what do you want to say to the dark side, to the New World Order, uh, to the uh, people that want to destroy humanity? I think if I came face to face and, and, I, and, I, and I looked them in the eyes, I think I would basically have to impart to them. They watch. That, Talk to them right there. <laughs> Look them in the eye. I think I'd want to say, you know, you're not, you're not dealing with men that are cut from the cloth that you presented to us. Um, we're a different kind of men, like men that have come before us that was truth tellers. Um, we become larger than life if we end up six feet under. Yeah, that really, doesn't, that, that really doesn't move us. We're probably larger than life once we make our transition. But while we're here breathing on this, on this earth, um, we'd like for you just put your sword down and come on this side simply because the grass is just a little bit greener and safer on this side simply because they're probably using you. Now, those of you all that are working for this element that you probably have no understanding, understanding of, that's who this particular message is for. Now, to the other people behind the scenes, we want to say this. We're going to be here regardless. Um, we don't care how you come at us, what methods you use, be it uh, covert, overt. It doesn't really matter. Um, we're linking up. We've already we already knocked down one wall. You're seeing white and black um, come to, come together because we haven't fell for the trick that you put out there for us. It's about the information. It's about us being human and carrying this information forward to save the vast majority of people of the world that you're trying to kill. Plain and simple. Yeah, absolutely. The divide and conquer will fail. That's why they're really, really pushing hard. Professor Griff, powerful. Thank you. God Give bless you. Yes, sir. Amazing you. meeting you in person, man. Oh, give thanks. I'm about your height, so we're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, God bless you. We'll talk to All you right. soon. And, and yeah, we're going to try to develop some music together. We're going to make that happen. I'm, uh, the first bad Professor Griff album about to come out. That's right. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, bad. That's All, a joke. Right. All right, folks, that's it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Great job to the crew. The new edition, the July issue, is selling out very quickly. It's got 10 free bumper stickers that'll wake people up in your area if you post them in good places, if you know what I mean. Legal and lawful areas. America has been occupied by globalist forces. Listen to Alex Jones' show, Infowars.com. Infowars.com, forbidden information. Listen to Alex Jones. That's just the four big ones uh, that are right there. I mean, that'll really get people listening and waking up. That's who we want to go after, is not just the choir, and then six little ones. So four big ones, six little ones. Great to put on your book bags, your car. Please don't put these on police cars, whatever you do. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time. Again, great job with the crew. 
And let's go uh, see the show tonight with uh, LL Cool J, Ice Cube, uh, Ice Cube, De La Soul. And, and uh, how far is this tour going? All over the country? All over the country. The last stop is in LA. How many more stops? I think we have about five more stops. Yep. And and they've been selling out. Tonight's sold Sell it out. out. Yes, sir. So people, I guess people can't get tickets then. Are, are there any tickets no, left? No tickets. What about all over the country? They got to go to scalpers. I don't know what they're doing, but they're getting in one way or other by hook or crook. All right, thank you, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, that's it. We're out. All See right. you, uh, Lord willing, tomorrow night. InfoWars Nightly News, InfoWars.com. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show.